Welcome to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. I'm Justine Toe. And I'm Simon Smart. Well, Enviro Week is upon us. This is an initiative that gets young people to try out good habits uh, for a week that, in the long term, if they sustain these habits, can help create a sustainable future. So it has challenges like, you know, can you give up meat for a week? How about uh, drinking from the tap rather than buying bottled water? Or turning off electricity when you don't need it? Well, in light of Enviro Week, we thought we'd chat with Byron Smith. He's doing his doctorate in theology at Edinburgh University and has recently written a bunch of articles about the theology of climate change for Eternity newspaper. Byron, welcome to the program. G'day, glad to be here. Now, I get the impression from reading that article that she wrote in Eternity that while you were always um, aware, let's say, of human impacts on the environment, issues of sustainability, etc., that these weren't burning issues for you. But, you know, when you read this article, obviously something has changed. Can you explain? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, growing up, uh, I guess I was always aware in the background that uh, there were there were environmental problems around and they'd occasionally make the news and, uh, you know, you might study them uh, in school or, or, or so on. Uh, but they didn't really impinge much on my day-to-day thinking or, or behaviour. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, uh, I, I was well into my 20s, really, that I um, actually started to pay a bit more attention. Uh, and partially that was uh, due to my Christian faith uh, and, and just uh, coming to grow more into my Christian faith and, and realising just how important it is uh, as a Christian to be caring for our neighbours and uh, one of the ways that uh, we are affecting our neighbours uh, is through our environmental impact. And uh, as I started to, to just learn a little bit about um, some of these problems, particularly climate change, but, but also some others, uh, I realised that the, the actions of us as Australians are really having consequences all around the world. Uh, and some of those consequences are likely to last for a very long time. And uh, uh, there's a verse in the Bible that says, love does no harm to its neighbour. But I realised that uh, Australian lifestyles are doing harm to our neighbours. Yeah, Byron, what sort of things are you talking about there? That what's, what is it about the lifestyle itself, something most of us have come to love, that might be harmful for other people? When you um, try to add up all the different uh, impacts of our lifestyle, all the, all the uh, travel that we do, the, the energy that we use to heat our homes and cool them, the, uh, the, the stuff that we buy, consumer products... Uh, the food that we eat, uh, all that has an impact uh, in different ways uh, on the environment. And um, uh, some attempts to try to add that up into a single metric, um, try to calculate an ecological footprint to calculate the total land area that your lifestyle uses. And when you add up the the average land area required for all those resources that we are consuming, uh, then Australians are uh, are using more than our fair share. If, if everyone were living like us, we'd need more than three planets. Well, we actually asked people on the streets of Sydney what it was about people, let's say, that might explain their attitudes to the environment. So let's have a listen to what they said. Because we use too much, waste too much, and economic concerns come before environmental concerns in a lot of countries. We can only control what we can control. Uh, there are certain areas we have no control over, but. Uh, there are parts that we, we've got to play. Littering the countryside, you know, polluting the harbour here, etc, etc. Well, I just think it's uh, an awful indictment on human beings that we would trash the place and it's not very pleasant for our neighbours in the, in the sense that other animals and creatures on this earth are suffering and... I'm not concerned. I'd say it's something that plays in the back of all of our minds that eventually one day you know, there might not be <laughs> much left of, of our natural resources and, and rainforests. And, and I think Australia's in the forefront in the, in, in the global sense because we're obviously um, you know, protecting parts of the Daintree rainforests, you know, have, have, have a good um, scope on those things. But it's the, it's the countries that don't have the education to understand what detrimental impacts development does in a lot of those unique areas, especially in parts of you know, South America. What do you think it is about human nature that makes us trash the planet? Greed and the need for sort of comfort. The solution seems to me often talked about in terms of practicalities, but I'm not sure that's the right way to go. I think maybe the solution needs to be much more spiritual so that um, if we care about ecologies and environments, if we have a spiritual connection with places, 
then we're probably less likely to do harmful things. Okay, that, that was people on the streets of Sydney. Now, some noted that human greed is a major problem, and you've obviously identified that. And, you know, it seems that the people that we spoke to didn't consider greed necessarily to be a spiritual issue, but certainly they recognise that we're using more than our fair share, and, and it's quite a selfish way to use the environment. Now, Byron, I want to ask you, because young people are consistently polled as being really concerned about the environment, but they at the same time, and I include myself in this, if I can be an honorary young person here, you know, we want the latest gadget, we want to go overseas, uh, we want to buy books that get shipped over. So those like cheap books have massive carbon miles. I'm out myself here as being that, um, that, that kind of person. So initiatives like EnviroWeek are, are designed to get us to consider our choices more, but is it enough? Uh I think things like EnviroWeek are a great um, first step for people to start thinking about how our actions uh, have consequences beyond what we can see. Uh, and so a lot of the, the, um, the possible things that uh, you're being encouraged to do in Environmental Week are, are, are good things to do and they're, they're good first steps. Um, but uh, if they become a, a sort of, well, I've been there, done that, uh, then I, I'm not sure you've really understood the scale of the problem. Uh, that we're, we're not talking just about doing a bit more recycling uh, or occasionally walking. Uh, if, if Australians are using three planets worth of resources, then uh, we need some, some, some larger changes to really be happening if we're uh, uh, not going to be taking more than our fair share. Now, Byron, there are plenty of people who will want to question everything you're talking about here in the sense that they don't share the belief that the sort of changes that you're describing are caused primarily by human beings. So I'm just wondering, how do you find a good way of having a conversation with those people and finding a bit of common ground? Is that possible? Uh, yeah, I find it often is. I mean, I talk with all kinds of people in, in different forums, online or in person, uh, and, and very often you can find common ground. Uh, you find that most people do have a basic sense of um, uh, justice uh, and, and, and fairness. Uh, and so the idea that we're taking more than our fair share is an idea that, that has some resonance. Uh, uh, one of the issues is that uh, we don't see that directly. And so we do need to rely uh, on others who are studying these things to get a real sense of, of what is happening. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there is still debate about uh, the, the precise details here and there. Uh, but really, I, I, as I've read uh, extensively over the last years uh, during my PhD and a bit before, uh, the, the scientific debate is really in a very different place to where the public debate is at. Uh, the scientists aren't debating, uh, are we changing the earth? Uh, the scientists aren't debating, are the consequences likely to be negative? They're debating, will the consequences be disastrous or catastrophic if we keep going on our current course? That's where the scientific debate's at. Now, Byron, you mentioned that your Christian faith is first what led you to, you know, to, to think about this issue. But I do think that there is a perception in the community that people of faith generally aren't that interested in the environment. And for some of uh, the older members of that community, they doubt that climate change is a problem and even less that humans have anything to do with this problem that doesn't exist for them. So what's going on there? Yeah, great question. Uh, first, let me say that um, both in my own experience and, and, and from polls, uh, that, it, that such people are still in the minority, even amongst Christians, uh, that, that really most people do acknowledge that we have a problem here. Um, but uh, the, 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 not everyone does. There's still disagreement. There are ongoing debates. Uh, and what's happening there? Well, it's a complex picture. Uh, partially, there is still legitimate debate about just how big the problem is. Um, uh, but, but I think a lot of the, the heat in the debate is, is, comes because these issues have implications for how we see ourselves. Uh, if, if we really are taking far more than our fair share, uh, then that, that challenges our sense of self uh, and perhaps even the contribution we might have made to society. Um, uh, and, and those things are quite deeply challenging for all of us. Um, it, it's, it's hard work to have to rethink uh, your picture of yourself. And so we all engage in some, some little shortcuts uh, that enable us to keep thinking of ourselves in good ways rather than having to, to see ourselves as part of the problem. Well, uh, Clive Hamilton says that on this issue we are everyday denialists. So is, does your Christian faith and your theology speak into that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree with Clive uh, uh, on this, on uh, Professor Hamilton, uh, that um, uh, our, uh, even for the people who accept uh, the science here, all of us 
keep living in ways that imply that we don't really accept it. Uh, and um, this is... Uh, Are you looking at me, Bo? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking in the mirror over there, actually, uh, at myself. Um, and uh, uh, my Christian faith does have a lot to say uh, here because, um, uh, you know, one of the things that Jesus said is the truth will set you free. Uh, and so I want to I want to live in light of the truth, uh, not in light of a convenient half truth. Uh, and so I think my Christian faith uh, gives me the courage to walk into dark places, uh, even dark places about myself, uh, and and to face the facts that I may be part of the problem. Um, uh, it also uh, part of the way that it gives me that courage is by assuring me that when I do that, I don't um, stop being loved by God. I don't stop being a precious creature. Uh, far from it, actually. Walking into the truth uh, is, is precisely what God's love for us invites us to do. And, and there's a sense, especially even on this uh, issue, that you can be, start to become part of, a, of some sort of solution, right? Oh, absolutely. Now, we've got an election coming up. Uh, people often identify the economy as the biggest issue. Uh, who's going to manage the economy better? Uh, do you think our obsession with economic growth is the reason why there's a lack of meaningful action when it comes to this issue of climate change? I think it's one of the reasons. Uh, it, it, it is a strong part of our culture, particularly the political culture and the business culture uh, that really looks in terms of uh, uh, short-term growth uh, in GDP. Uh, and, and growth is a good thing. I like growth. I want my children to grow up. Um, and in some parts of the world, they really need economic growth because they, they, they need clean water, they need education and so on. But I also want my children to reach a point where they don't need growth anymore, uh, where they're mature. Uh, and um, uh, I think that once we've got all our basic needs met, then other things become more important than growth. Uh, and and uh, really, there also comes a point where uh, growth reaches the limits of what's uh, uh, ecologically possible, reaches environmental limits. Um, and so there's a there's a, a quote from a U.S. senator, uh, which is that uh, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. Uh, and what that's really getting at is that um, uh, the, the environment isn't just um, a, a, an optional extra, a luxury that we get to if we're rich enough. Caring for the environment is is a, an essential uh, that's needed for life. Now, um, climate change scientists say that even a two degree rise in temperatures can be absolutely catastrophic um, for you know ecosystems, rising sea levels. But correct me if I'm correct me if I'm wrong. But I think in some ways you've got scientists who, who are saying that we're actually heading towards four degrees. And so, you know, this is obviously really even more serious than we thought. Um, some people have said that there's even a specter of civilizational collapse. And I don't want to use that alarmist language, but you know we have to face that some people are saying that. So I think we can agree that it's a very grim picture. How do you not lose hope in, in the face of that? Yeah, it is a serious picture. Uh, I, I would say that two degrees is disastrous, but not quite catastrophic. Um, uh, that is because four degrees is still significantly worse and, and six degrees will be even worse than that. That is, uh, we can still draw distinctions that are meaningful. Uh, and, and if it turns out that we fail to uh, keep the warming to, to two degrees and we face uh, really serious consequences as a result, it, it doesn't mean that we should give up because there's still a real difference between four degrees and five degrees or between three degrees and four degrees. Uh, and so uh, part of how I don't give up uh, is uh, in recognising that um, even partial victories uh, still have significance, uh, particularly for future generations. And so now as a father, you know, this is something that's on my mind more. Uh, what's my life, what's the life for my children going to be like in 50 years time? Uh, and what's the life of their children going to be like? Uh, and so uh, part of why we don't give up, even though at the moment it seems like we're failing pretty badly, uh, is because our actions today will continue to have consequences for a very long time. Uh, but the other reason why I don't give up is that, that, at a, is that as a Christian, I believe that uh, uh, God gives us hope even in the darkest of places. Not necessarily hope that we'll be able to escape them or that he'll give us a get out of jail free card so that we don't really have to face how bad things are. Uh, but hope uh, that he will keep giving us strength to walk through it, uh, keep giving us strength to be honest with ourselves and with one another about the scale of the problem, um, and hope that he'll keep giving us creativity um, and, and uh, the, the, the courage to act. Yeah, it's, I think we get a sense of how overwhelming the, the, the problem is, but at the same time there is that small glimmer of hope. So we wish you the best when it comes to you know, continuing to advocate for, for good action on behalf of people of faith for, for climate change. 
Now you blog at Nothing New Under the Sun, is that right? I'm, yeah. I'm imagining that you pursue these issues on that blog. Yeah, I do. So again, that's Nothing New Under the Sun. Just Google that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.